And I'm speaking from the perspective of this very small country in West Africa. This is called Guinea-Bissau. It used to be Portuguese Guinea and has been independent since 74. And I have worked there since 78. And during that period, uh, <clears throat> 10 years ago, we had a war. So it's a quite different context that most of you probably have. And some of my concerns in terms of registration and data is related to the situation I faced when we had the war, namely, what should I prioritize? What should I do? How can I, what can I do to sort of approve or alleviate the situation of the population? When I started in Guinea-Bissau, every second child died before five years of age. That's the background. This is an area with, with very high mortality, and mortality was like that at the time of decolonization in West Africa. This is not unique. This is slightly late to have such a high mortality, but it's not unique for the time of decolonization in West Africa. What I have is called a health and demographic surveying system. We are following a population which is in the capital, roughly one third of the capital, 100,000 people is under survey and we register all of the pregnancies and birth and we follow the children in terms of health services they are using to see what is important and what is not important. We are also having some surveys in the interior, we are following 200 villages in the interior of Guinea-Bissau and have probably the best data in Guinea-Bissau in terms of white registration. Um, <coughs> Just to give you a little, which one is this? A little bit of indication of what is the background here. We have to paint the numbers of the houses for us to be able to find around, to follow, find the people again. And we get this sort of map where we have, there's no public map here. We are doing the maps on ourselves. We have to be able to find back to the population to be able to say, did that person die or survive? So we had this sort of list where children are followed, children are visited every three months at home, children under three years of age, and we visit them to be able to say what services did they use, did they, were they hospitalized, hospitalized zero here, were they hospitalized, did they take any vaccines, vaccines are here, what vaccines have they been vaccinated with, with, are they breastfeeding, are they not breastfeeding, what's their arm circumference as a nutritional indicator. Those are the kind of data we have been collecting routinely for many years. <coughs> we are also, well, just to give you a summary here, you can see the kind of data we would have is breastfeeding, supplementary feeding. Early we did height and weight, but that cost too much. So now we are using the other arm to conference as an indicator of nutritional status. We are collecting information on measles, whooping cough, polio, hospitalization, and all routine vaccination with dates and all the campaigns with vitamin A, etc. <coughs> we are collecting risk factors, pigs is a risk factor if you would want to know, bed nets or whether you are living together with the, <coughs> the mother. So that is sort of the background. We had a lot of data on this population before the war started. And we also have data on the hospital. For the last 15 years, we have been registering all the, <coughs> all the hospital, like pediatric hospitalization. So we can actually follow the population there when they go to the hospital, what's the risk factors for being hospitalized, but also what happens afterwards. There is a very high post-hospitalization mortality in this area. Just as a background to understand some of the things I would be saying, when I came to West Africa 32 years ago, everybody knew that the reason that children are dying in Africa of things like measles, which doesn't kill children in Europe or the US, is that they are malnourished. So you have got a good example here. Children whose death might be prevented by measles vaccine are on the road to death and their <coughs> nutritional status is so poor that they're more likely to die of any infectious <coughs> disease. Thus, preventing a death with a vaccine among these children may not necessarily save a life, but, also, but only change the course of death. That was the attitude 30 years ago. It's the weak ones dying. It's the nutrition which is the biggest problem. Sweden funded a project to reduce malnutrition in order to reduce mortality. We have reduced mortality down to around 100, but we haven't changed nutritional status in this population. The real problem here in this community is overcrowding, which was called overcrowding in the old days. 
That's the situation. When you put so many children into the one house, you have rapid transmission of infections, you get very severe infection. The mechanism in this is that the intensity of exposure is the determining cause of mortality. So it's the kids getting infected at home who die from measles, whooping cough, chickenpox, etc. polio. What ha you can see it here, this is the case fatality for index case. Index case being the child who are bringing the infection back home, and that's the mortality among secondary cases in these three age groups. That observation has been repeated in all the places where it has been tested. And I have tested in all European data, exactly the same happened in Europe a hundred years ago. It suggests when you bring people very close together, you may increase mortality. And I think that's critical for understanding what happened here. What happened in Guinea-Bissau was, in <coughs> June 98, the president attempted to arrest the chief of the army, and he wanted to use him as a scapegoat because he had a conflict with Senegal. But that's details we're not going into here. That led to a rebellion among the officers, and the officers took the barrack which controlled the entry to the city. And the president invited the troops from the neighboring countries, Senegal and Conakry, and these fo foreign troops started shooting out of the rebels. They came in through the harbor from the sea with the cannons into the center of the capital, and they started shooting at the rebe rebels outside uh, the city, and then they shot back, and within 10 days, essentially everyone had fled. The only one staying to back behind was the soldiers, the thieves, and very old people who refused to move anymore. And then, of course, the dogs and the pigs. Most people fled, you see, kind of, this was the national lab was, was hit and burned down. The national deposit for drugs were also burned in the first week of the conflict, so there were no, no, no drugs available. Just to give some indication here how the houses, I think 15% of the houses in, in my study area were destroyed. Um, through a combination of bombs and rain. So if you get hole in your, in your roof and then the rain comes, then the house would sort of be washed away. What happened here was that we had this capital on the sea and then the rebels out here shooting in and the foreign soldiers shooting out and then the population fled this way out. This was the only road where they could flee with, the, with cars. Although you could walk out here, but most people went this way. And this area used to have 7,000 people. And during the conflict, in certain periods in the conflict, we had 50 to 80,000 people. That's an enormous increase in the number of population. And some t in, we measured at the height of the conflict, we measured that there were, in the houses out in the rural area, there were 100 people per house. That's an enormous amount of people. So they were staying under the same roof. They, <coughs> These houses, Guinean houses, had verandas, so people were sort of <coughs> sleeping on the veranda in these houses. There were enormous, declared crowding.